Hi there, welcome to the Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. My name is Ali Beg. If you are wondering what this channel is all about, just let me very briefly explain to you. So the idea behind the concept is for me to talk to pop stars, both past and present, about their careers. We discuss a number of different topics, including fame, and whether having a number one record and performing in front of hundreds of thousands of screaming fans is actually everything that it's cracked up to be. So what gives me the right to speak to these people? Well, I was once a member of a relatively successful boy band called Bad Boys Inc. in the early to mid 1990s. What I want to do is see if our stories match, see if we can find the common ground and see if the DNA is actually the same. For this episode, I was absolutely delighted to have caught up with Lindsay Armow from Bewitched, who when they broke onto the scene, broke all sorts of chart records. It's absolute testament to their friendship and their bond that they continue to perform today and release records to this day. Lindsay and I spend about an hour together chatting about all sorts of different topics. She was, as you would expect, fantastic, and I really hope you enjoy our chat. Welcome to the Accidental Pop Star, Lindsay Armow from Bewitched. Hi, Lindsay. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for jumping on. It's a pleasure oh. to have you on the show. And I'm delighted you're the first female that we've got on the show as well. So Never. thank you. Yes. Oh, yay. I feel privileged. Yeah, I'm <laughs> delighted that you're here. Let's jump yeah. straight in. I want to yeah. ask you, and I want to take you right back to sort of your, your early age and what you can first yeah. remember. When you saw other bands and you decided that this could potentially be the path that you wanted to go down, did you sort of any, have any preconceived ideas of what it would take to be a member of a band? No, I don't think I had any ideas of what it would take, to be honest. I think you see the outside, don't you? You see the polished performances and, you know, these bands who are kind of, you know, rehearsed and they're doing all these shows and TV shows and whatever else. Um, and for me, it was kind of... I always knew I wanted to get into music. I wasn't sure whether it was within a band or myself or even just as a producer or writer. I didn't know yet at that point. But I think I think the beauty of it at the time was the naivety that we all had, actually, the four of us at the very beginning was what I think gave us the determination and the drive to succeed in the end because had we known the reality of it had we known you know how hard it was how hard work it was how all consuming it was i don't know if we we may have got a bit kind of hesitant about it and thought oh gosh i don't know if we can do that or whatever but i think we were just we just loved the job so much we were just all in and with that naivety came dedication and motivation i think which we you know. will come on to a little bit later because it's the that side of the of being in a band is what I find particularly interesting. But when mm. did, when did you first find out that there was talk of this all girl band forming? Um, I was. We had a mutual friend, so the the three girls had actually already formed the band and they were together for a few months. Um, and they um they had already recorded two or three songs. And they were looking for a fourth member because they just felt like that's what they wanted. Mm. And there was um, a guy who I was friends with. Um, we all kind of knew each other to say hi in a dance centre in Dublin. Um, it's called Diggs Lane. So there was always kind of that familiarity with, the, you know, lots of people kind of started there like Boys Own. And um, uh, there's loads of bands anyway that start, started off there. But um this guy called Graham, he was a friend of mine and he was also a friend of the girls. And when they had obviously said to him that they were looking for a fourth member, he was like, I've got her. She's perfect for you guys. She'll fit in, you know. And then we, he introduced us and that was kind of it, really. Um, we had this meeting. I say meeting is actually quite funny because like when I think back to it now, 
when you kind of turn up for any kind of a job interview type meeting you kind of really make an effort and you're like fully prepared and you know you're groomed and this that and the other but I turned up in a tracksuit and my hair gelled back I had bleached blonde really short hair at the time and I just gelled it back and like trainers and I came with a cassette tape of a few songs that I had written and recorded on my dictaphone That's brilliant. <laughs> and and funnily enough the girls well Kiwi and Adele when I walked in they were wearing pretty much the same as me they had their track suits on and their hairs gelled back and I was like yeah like we're similar this is cool and um they were like oh you know Graham said you can sing and dance and I said oh yeah here's my tape so they put the tape on they were like oh yeah that's really cool and then Sinead walked in and I was like oh who's this is this like the manager or and because she looked so different she was she walked in in a little mini skirt and white tights and black patent leather shoes she's going to kill me for telling you this and she just looked so different it was like okay but it was perfect because it's like you have to have variety within a band and you have to have just you know a, a kind of diversity of styles and people in a band to make it work yeah. anyway so it's it's just funny looking back now because it was so blasé and it was so relaxed and at the end of the meeting they were like so do you want to be in our band and I was like yeah okay cool uh, oh, okay cool we're, we're, we're rehearsing all week and we're writing we're in the studio next week and we're on tv the following week doing a, a, a morning show um and I was like oh cool okay and that was it so the, the the morning show was um it's called TX and it was a little bit like CD UK type that kind of thing over in Ireland um and they had us on as a special little slot of kind of newcomers and stuff because they'd spotted the girls rehearsing in one of the studios in Diggs Lane one day yeah. and they'd asked them to come on and it was actually at that um morning show that we bumped into Louis Walsh oh, okay. who was managing Boyzone at the time yeah. and he had met Keegan and Adele before he he knew them to say hi to because obviously Shane Lynch is in Boyzone that's their brother um so he was like oh hi girls this that and the other we had a little chat and then he said to us do you know what he said I think I might have someone who'd be interested in managing you she's got she's looking for a girl band she's over in London um I'll put her in touch with you so anyway they then she came over to Ireland like a few weeks later and she ended up being our manager just Kim. So that's how it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know Kim? Yeah, yeah. yeah I know her very well. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. She. But she that was sort of around about our time. She was looking after at the time they were called PJ and Duncan. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a small industry, really, I, isn't it? I, I, <laughs> everyone so she, waiting. Everyone knows each other. She be, so she became your manager. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So once she became your manager, did you yeah. then? Did you guys sort of all sit together? and sort of plan a roadmap for what you were going to do, how you were going to achieve it? And did you set yourself any sort of goals in the early days? No. And this is what I mean by the, the naivety of it was like, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a business plan in our head. It was just, it was just a dream. It was a dream that we were willing to jump into with, you know, both feet and just go for it and just work hard and, take grab opportunities as they came and see where they led to that that was it it was the commitment actually do you know mm. it, and I think this is where sometimes the stars align because to get four people to meet to me and for their lives to coincide at the time at the right time where each of those people has the same amount of commitment to a dream a pipe dream that may or may not ever come true is so rare and that is what we had. And we weren't put together by a management team. We weren't put together by auditions. We found each other and then we went looking for the rest of the team. So that was a slightly different, I suppose, to a lot of the bands who were around at the time. Um, you know, there was so many pop bands in the 90s, as you know. Yeah. It was saturated. And most of those bands were put together by auditions. And in turn, there was... Not not for all of those bands, I have to say, but for a lot of them, there were problems down the line because you either didn't have the right dynamic or there were internal problems or it just didn't work or whatever. But I do believe that there's something in that that we actually put ourselves together. I do. We're, we're here. We are still together this day. Yeah, we're exactly. still 
which I think is testament to your friendship yeah. and your dynamic yeah. together. Because yeah. for us, we were very much manufactured and very much put together by a producer. And I found yeah. myself in a situation where I had to become friends and like three complete and utter strangers. Yeah, and get thrown yeah. into a situation which was just absolutely mind blowing and then I deal know. with it all together at the yeah. same time. And I and I wonder if because you guys knew each other and because you had that friendship and that drive yeah. early on, it sort of put you on a different level because yeah. it I, I I hope, I hope you understand where I'm coming from this, but mm. I guess in the early days, you guys weren't competitive with each other because I started to think no. you were being competitive with each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and I get it because you've got, you've got people, four or five, whatever, how many people are in the band yeah. who all have a passion for this. And so, so naturally you want to be seen naturally. You want to have, as much input as someone else or you want your ideas to be heard as much as someone else I think that's natural mm -hmm. I think it's what degree that goes to and when it starts becoming an issue then obviously then that's a problem but I think possibly what we then had was we had the, the ability to actually relate to each other yeah on a, a firstly a friendship basis and actually more like family to be honest mm -hmm. on a friendship basis rather than on a kind of business basis so it was friendship first you know and it was like if at any time we had problems it was you know you, you get through them and you and you talk about them and you or you fight about them or whatever but it was kind of like I don't I don't feel like there was I feel like we were a team I don't feel like there was competition with each other in that respect yeah which I think um reflected in your success can I ask yeah who yeah. who made the sort of the decisions in regards to your image um because the word tomboy has been thrown about a lot when it comes to yeah. how you guys the sort of the image was portrayed are you comfortable yeah. are you comfortable with that term yeah. yeah well i think three of us kind of were already we had to twist Sinead's arm a little bit okay. but, uh, <laughs> but um yeah do you know the thing about the styling and the and the image um is interesting because initially I think we we in our minds we were like you want to be a bit like an Irish version of TLC like you know really cool <laughs> I mean we couldn't have been further from that <laughs> but that was what we had in our minds but um yeah it was a gradual process I think actually and it was a creative process because our like if I look back to the very very beginning before we had management and before we then had a producer and a rep company on board the style did change considerably um and I think it was when, I think it was only when Sailor V was in the bag and we'd written Sailor V and Sony were like, right, this is the first single for sure. Um, it's a hit, um, you know, all systems go. And at that point then it was like, right, bring in the stylists, bring in the photographers, let's have some trial sessions. And I think we did about two or three photo shoots before we got the look right. And I think it ended up being the denim for this particular video shoot for Sailor V. Mm. and it worked and it was like there was something just so right about it because it was cool and stylish but also tomboyish which is what we were and let's not forget that our dance routines were crazy yeah so we had to wear we had to be able to wear trainers with whatever we wore so there was no point in us wearing little tight bodycon dresses you know, it just wouldn't have been right for the for the for our stage performances. We had to wear trainers. We had to have comfortable shoes. So therefore, it needed to be something that was going to work with that. And denim kind of ticked all those boxes. And it's also so relatable. You know, the fans would just like turn up to all our concerts later on and just head to toe in denim. And it was just like anybody can get their hands on denim. It didn't have to try that hard to look like us. You know. So, and I think, you know, we were never that type of girl band that was all about the glitz and the glam. Yeah. We were never just, we just weren't. And naturally that's how, you know, our personalities were. It was all quite, it was all quite casual. It was all quite comfortable, um, edgy actually, I think a little bit as well, you yeah. know. How exciting so, was that period when you signed your record deal? And did you have to pinch yourself? Um yeah i'm trying to think back now i think it was 
it was exciting and a bit scary at the same time. Yeah, because all of a sudden um, it's now very real. That's what I remember. Yeah, I, I think it, it wasn't so much that. I think it was it was kind of like, you know, when you sit and there's a contract and it's that thick mm -hmm. and it's like, mm -hmm. are we signing our lives away here? What what does this all mean? And it's trying to get the, the right legal advice and everything else. So I think there was it was a it was a strange time because we were so it, it felt like we're just on the cusp of this being you know it, it, our, our dreams coming true basically um but we have to get through this bit and it's like get it right because you hear of so many stories don't you where bands and artists just don't get the right representation and then end up you know not getting anything out of it so we wanted to get this bit right you know even at that age we were quite even though we weren't necessarily savvy, we were we were quite we had our heads screwed on in that respect. Um. So yeah, of course it was exciting and and everything else, and it was just like, oh my god, you know, we had um there was probably a period of about three or four months where we used to go over and stay in Kim's house, and then she'd bring us to meet record companies and stuff like that and different producers. And when we used to meet a record company, we used to wherever it may be, in a hotel lobby, in a restaurant, we would just stand up and start and do an acapella and start singing. Mm. Um, so it was like, we just we just knew that we had, like, we couldn't be shy. We couldn't, you know what I mean? It was just like, we just had, we just go for it. Um, and then there was this, and then with Sony, when we met Sony, um, we had our producer on board at the time, Ray Hedges. He he was the catalyst for us so when we teamed up with ray that is when the final piece of the puzzle fit because he was kind of the fifth member really yeah. in terms of where he would then take us musically and creatively and he had a, he was a, he had a huge influence on everything um and then he brought us to sony and we had this mad tea party we put on a tea party because he was like we need to do something different we need to like think of something a bit wacky and a bit like that's going to really grab their attention and he was like a tea party we we're like a tea party he's like yeah that's awesome so we put on this tea party and the two heads of sony at the time came to this weird they, i could just see their faces were kind of going <laughs> what is going on so we had a big table a long table full of sweets and popcorn and jelly and ice cream and fizzy drink like everything you can imagine and uh we were just yeah we were just like being really chatty and then we sang a few songs and this that and the other this is like this is the way it happened back in the day or I don't know how it happens these days but I guarantee you there'll be no tea parties um we just quickly and, signed our deal in the boardroom and that was it it was done it was just signed yeah. yeah and it was all done it was done it, a couple of press photographs and it was done in a heartbeat but shall I tell you yeah. what I've never forgotten I because at the time I was living on Chiswick High Road and, okay. Um, somebody who was very closely affiliated to the band, he lived yeah. not that far from me, so he gave me a lift home. And he kept saying to me, you're a pop star. You're now a pop yeah. star. You're going to be a pop star. Get it in your head. Get get your head around it. You're now a pop star. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't get my head around it at all. And to be honest with mm -hmm. you, I didn't want to get my head around it. After you signed your deal, when did it dawn on you or when did the penny drop? I'm now a pop star. Um, I think when Sailor V hit number one. Okay. Yeah. Um, not until that point at all. No. Right. I think at that point when Sailor V hit number one, we had done a lot of groundwork before the, the single was released. We were up and down the country umpteen times doing under 18s nightclubs and yeah. radio shows and, um, school assemblies i mean we worked our pants off yep. um and then sailor v was released in the may and you get you remember you used to get a midweek chart position and when we got the midweek and it was number one it was just like fantastic what now what now what what do you mean what what number one what? and then when it hit number one that sunday from then it felt like almost overnight you were famous. It was like suddenly everyone was stopping you on the street. You were on MTV all the time. And what was the other one? The box. It was like every time you turned it on, we were on. Um, 
and yeah it it was the fame just kind of it kind of happened like that with that song so how did you cope with that because your fame has become instant how did you cope with it um i think well at the time initially um we had each other mm. we had our little you know nucleus which was us <laughs> and we kept each other grounded and you know just kind of you know what i'm so glad we had each other because i look at other artists at the time who were on their own like billy and a couple of other like um solo artists and i just think it's such a lonely place if you're if you're not in a band yeah um but yeah it was it was very surreal actually i think the fame thing i mean even now it fame is such a weird concept such a weird concept when you think about it and it's it is just a concept it's not real in that sense it's not tangible it's a concept so i think if you're aware of that and if you can take it as that that's what it is then you can find a place for it in your life and, and kind of in your reality and you put it in its box and you get on with your life um but I can see how it can alter your state of reality. It can alter your sense of reality, especially yeah. at a young age where you're so easily influenced, you know? You see, I had this, um, I, I suffered from this tension of opposites where mm. um, I would, at home, in the privacy of my own home, when the door was locked, I yeah. could be myself. I could watch yeah. the football. I could shout and scream at football. I could talk to my brother. I could talk to my family and, mm. my friends and just be normal. But I felt as soon as I walked out the door, all of a sudden I had to become Ali, this pop star. Yeah. And I felt like I was acting all the time. Yeah. And it made me hugely uncomfortable. I have to be honest. Were mm. you were you comfortable with the fame? Um, I wouldn't say a hundred percent. No. Okay. And and I think as time has passed, I probably feel less comfortable. Mm. And. I think initially there's an excitement that kind of overrides the discomfort because it's like, oh my gosh, like we got recognized. This is so cool, you know, because recognition equals success, right? Yeah. Um, and to a degree it does in that in that industry because the more people who know you probably means they're buying your records and etc. But I think, yeah, I definitely wasn't a hundred percent comfortable with it. Like, I am quite a private person and i i like anonymity mm. um so interestingly i think we're all quite similar in that respect and interestingly as well we were never really a tabloid worthy band like as as people and as a band we were never really in the tabloids very much um we were in media like we were in magazines and on TV because that was our job. And we, we would do organized interviews and photo shoots and performances. That's, but we were never, we never kind of chased that. We never really chased the profile side of it, you know? And I think that probably is because there is a sense of, you know what, there is a boundary. This is our public persona and this is what we do in the public arena. But there is a line there is a line to be drawn and I think some celebrities and, and people in the public eye do it well and others not so much and they invite it more and they they thrive on it more and they want it more. I, I wouldn't have been that type of person. I would kind of have that boundary and be like, okay, now I'm closing my doors and this is my private life, yeah. you know? Yeah, totally get that. I was exactly the same. Um, you mentioned your dance routines earlier. So I was watching your first appearance on Top of the Pops this morning. And mm. I, I, com I, I confess, I forgot how high energy your routines were. So me too. I was, oh, dear me, I was very much the same. And I confess, <laughs> I could not control my breath at the time. Yeah. I, I was mm -hmm. so exhausted because they were so high mm. energy, which so meant hard. in turn, I couldn't sing. Yeah. I couldn't hit the notes that we were supposed to hit and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Did you ever have any of those issues? I can relate to that and I sympathise with that because I do struggle as well um, and did do at the time as well. I find it really hard to combine 
the physical moving and controlling your breath and vocal like so hard um it's not natural is it you're bouncing around and that you're trying to get this like perfect singular note which isn't wobbling and isn't is on perfect pitch and it's just like how <laughs> how are you supposed to do that i think some people are better than others at doing it um i do struggle with it i have to say um but i think it's like everything as well it's like the more you do it it's like muscle memory yeah, you're exactly. you just get used to it it's really weird mm. and it's almost like your vo your vocal cords know what to do because that matches with that move and it's done it a thousand times before so it's easy you know what i mean it's like the more you do it the kind of less effort it becomes the but best, it is definitely not easy the best piece of advice i was ever given was from our vocal coach who was the yeah. the, the the lead of a gospel choir this amazing wow. church out of uh, east end of london wow he said to me in the early days because i wasn't a trained singer i had to learn it on the job and he said to yeah. me, he said there's a playback tape behind you that's your that's your backup and you've got matthew singing live up front so all you've got yeah. to do is to just sing just yeah. sing just boom it out because they can't hear you in front because they're all screaming yeah. as loud as they yeah. possibly can so he said so just sing and mm. sing when you know your parts are going to come in and eventually yeah. you'll get used to it and your diaphragm yeah. will get used to it your throat will get used to it and you'll be able to sing my god yeah. six months later oh my god what a difference yeah but i know it's nerve-wracking you know just nerve -wracking. Booming, it out, booming it out yeah no. yeah no nerve-wracking especially as you say not like trained uh, trained singer i wasn't either to be honest like not at all i wasn't a trained singer or a trained dancer yeah, um, <laughs> on the job <laughs> exactly how do you guys or why do you guys think you were able to break america um two reasons we're irish <laughs> they love the irish <laughs> always helps <laughs> yeah and and also we worked really 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 hard out there yeah. um it's such a massive territory and if you are not willing to actually spend the time then it's never ever going to work and we did the best part of 18 months solidly doing back-to-back -to -back tours out there mm -hmm. um which generated such a big fan base and then we got big tvs like jay leno and rosie o'donnell mm -hmm. um and um the osmond show as well so it was like yeah, you know, it was, it literally was, we were on the ground out there. You cannot have success in the States unless you're there doing the groundwork. And we really did. Like we were up and down the States so many times in a tour bus, sleeping on a tour bus overnight, just mm -hmm. doing the rounds. Like, and it was, you're talking about three, four month tours each time because it's so big. Like over here in the UK, you do a UK arena tour or theater tour or whatever. And it's about two weeks, maybe three at a push there. It's, three months <laughs> so it was a massive commitment and it was a lot of work and and it's you know we are still quite young and it's being away from family and friends and it's just being on the road and it's you know you're homesick and it's hard like but at the same time we had the time of our lives I remember that the America time being one of my favorite times because I just was that your wow moment I don't know if it was my wow moment but it was my really take it all in moment because okay. I think I think because of the vastness of America, a lot of the time was spent traveling from state one state to another on a bus. So you did have a bit of downtime. Yeah. Um, so you would travel overnight and then you would get up the next day, maybe do a little bit of promo, have the afternoon kind of to chill out. And, and then the evening was the show and then get on the bus, do it again. And you, and you kind of had a bit of a chance in the afternoon to see a bit of where you were and walk around and explore a little bit. Whereas, in the other territories, it was always like, go, 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 go. Everything, the, the schedule was packed from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. every single day. We hardly had any days off at all in the, in the, in the early years. Um, so it was literally back-to-back -back schedule. So I think at, the, at that time, we didn't really have a chance to take stuff in and just process it all. Mm. But in America, I kind of feel like I really did, and that's and I really enjoyed that um my wow moment yeah. my first wow moment was 
when Celebi was number one and we were doing Top of the Pops that week. Firstly, just even that, right? <laughs> we're on Top of the Pops. <laughs> um, Best feeling secondly, ever. Yeah. But secondly, when we were backstage, we bumped into Celine Dion and the Bee Gees backstage. Oh, no way, did you? And we were chatting in the corridor and it was just like, what is going on right now? Yeah. Um, and Celine was like giving us bits of advice and they were just so lovely and down to earth. They stopped and they chatted to us for about 20 minutes. It wasn't even just, oh, hi, bye kind of thing. It's like real chat. So, yeah, that was probably the biggest and first wow moment. Um, I, I remember the, the first time we did Top of the Pops. I think it was the first time, if my memory serves me correct. And uh, Sir Cliff Richard invited us into his dressing room. Wow. Say hello. And he, he honestly, he was so nice and he gave us oh. fabulous advice. Mm. And he came and watched us rehearse because we had to do two rehearsals. We did a, a rehearsal in the afternoon, then a dress rehearsal for the cameras. Yeah. And then we did the show later on in the evening. And he came in and he watched our rehearsals and gave us tips and all that sort of stuff. He was oh. just, and I found, Lindsay, see the higher the, the level of fame? Yes. I found the nicer the people yeah. were. If they, were down at, if they were down at our level. Yeah. Oh, there was egos all over the place. Oh, I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear it. You know, yeah. It's, it's funny, know. isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I would like to, to, because obviously your success, you had four number one hits in a row, which was just at the yeah. time sensational. Um, yeah. But I want to skip forward a bit to mm -hmm. when it didn't quite go according to plan. So your hit record sort of started to sort of tail off a little bit. Yeah. Um, did you, and, I, I'm, and I'm only using my own experience here because we had exactly the same experience. We peaked at mm. number 10 and then our next record started to tail off, which started yeah. to create a little bit of tension. Yeah. Did you start to feel tension because of this? Do you, do you mean within the band? Yeah, within the band. Um, no, I don't think so. Um... I think if there was tension at that point, it wasn't because of that. It was kind of, I think we were at that, around that time, we were all a little bit jaded. Mm. And I think there, there probably was a period of time where there was a bit of tension because everyone was just, we, we were so exhausted, you know, with the schedule I've just described. And there was just, it was a lot. I think we needed a big long break at that point um but we didn't have it because rather than having a break we went to the states and promoted the first album there while we were writing the second album um and i think in that period of time the momentum in the uk might have been compromised exactly and then we came out with the second album and things started to not go quite as well as the first album yes momentum is um, a huge word lindsay it's a massive yeah word. yeah yeah, 100%. And especially between the first and second album, mm. in hindsight. I think after the second album, if you have a successful second album, you can then pace yourself a little bit, but it's it, that's the crucial bit. Um, but, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I definitely think we were overexhausted at that point. But um, if there was tension, it was probably behind the scenes and we didn't really we didn't really see it it was probably going on with you know kind of record company and they were maybe getting a bit worried or i don't know to be honest okay. the first we heard of it was um when we were doing this the third album and we'd spent a year and a half maybe a year writing it and we were ready ready to go with the first single uh, we were literally waiting for the phone call to say that all the video shoot had been booked. We were going to South Africa to do it and we were waiting for the phone call to say it's going to be on such a date. But instead, we got a phone call to say, oh, Sony dropped the album. We're not doing they, yeah. They've dropped the act. <laughs> like, Which is astonishing. I, I, I can't get my head around it. Can you, yeah. shed, can you shed any light on it? Yeah, so, well... So the um, director of Sony at the time, who had basically bewitched was his baby and he had taken it from the very early days right up until this point, he was promoted and he moved over to New York. Oh. 
And so someone else was brought in to take his place. Um, and there were changes then within the ref company. And for one reason or another, they decided that they were going to change up the look of the label and they wanted more playing bands and, and I don't know. But they decided to drop us. And yeah, I mean, I, I we were as shocked as you. It was it was it felt very out of the blue. And I, I think, you know, if you take a band that's selling the amount of albums that we sold on our second album in this day and age, and then imagine that a record company would then drop that act, it would just it seems so unfathomable. Like it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> it's like, but there's there's a okay, the second album may not have done as well as the first, but you know, it still sold X amount. It's like it's still a success. But that was just the trajectory of our career at the time, and that's just how it went. And um, who knows what the reason was? Who knows? You know. But I remember very vividly that we went through a, a similar situation. We got dropped as well. Mm. Now, it didn't come as a big surprise. We kind of knew it was it was coming. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was still hugely disappointed, but I have mm. to say the record company dealt with it with the, the utmost grace and they made sure that us as four young boys were looked after, that mm. nothing untowards would happen and that we wouldn't be left up in difficulties, which can't be said for what other things happened in and around us. So I won't mm. go into details about why we got dropped because it's very complicated. Right. For me, it was the final nail in the coffin. I was already sort of thinking about leaving anyway. Right. Me, that was it. That was the final nail in the coffin. Did you have the same feelings about being a member of Bewitched when once you got dropped? Um. Or did you want to come? You know, do you know what? At the time, what was going on for me was very, very different because um, there was something else that had happened in my in my life around that time, okay. and it kind of overshadowed everything for me. Okay. So I lost I lost my mum oh. in two thousand and one. Okay. And it was around the time that we were writing the third album. And and so I was in a very, in not a very good place. Um, and I was kind of, I was a little bit on a autopilot, like I was turning up the studio and I was, you know, I was doing that. But I think for me, probably timing wise, I needed a break I needed some time away from everything so in some ways that came at the right time however in hindsight I think actually what would have been perfect and ideal would have been if we'd had if, if we'd have been able to just take a long break yeah. and regroup after we've all kind of just had a break away from it it was so intense it was so all-consuming for you know a few years and just to be able to kind of reassess who are we as a band what do we want to do next you know let's explore our options etc but I think we didn't do that I don't know what why we didn't but I think at the time it didn't feel like we had that option it just felt like that was the end Sony dropped us. I think there was a small period of time where we did try and reach out to one or two other record companies to say, you know, is there interest there? But I think we had a little bit of interest from one, but it wasn't the right thing. And, you know, it just didn't, it kind of felt like, you know what, maybe we've had our day. Hmm. Maybe we've, maybe we could just go out at the top and that yeah. that's it. Yeah. Um. So that was the decision we made at the time. I think in hindsight, we could have, probably taken a break and then reinvented ourselves given the fact that we are doing that 25 years later we probably <laughs> could, we probably could have taken a year out you know it's taking you some time to do that <laughs> yeah exactly it's like who would have thought all yeah. this time later yeah. but yeah 
You see, that's interesting when you said about going out on top because, yeah. I, again, slightly indulge me because even though your success and our success is non-comparable, um, but at the time we were sort of deemed as being the third most popular boy band behind yeah, Take yeah. That and E17 while the lads and boys on were sort of making their way. Yes, yes, um, exactly, yeah, the timing of it. Yeah, mm. and then we'd won a couple of awards abroad, one which you can see behind yeah. me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'd won some magazine awards. So I just thought, look, just call it a day, you know. You guys can decide what you want to do, but my advice is just call it a day so that it, yeah. we don't do this. Because if we do yes. this, it's going to be really tough, really yeah. tough. Yeah. Um, so I remember waking up the morning after we left Radio 1 to, to announce mm. our decision to split. Yeah. And I was like, shit, what do I do now? No. Yeah. I had no idea, Lindsay, what to do next. No idea. Did you? It, no. And that is something, it, that is something, that's a very real thing. It's it crazy. really is. It's to go from being in a bubble where everything is done, for, not done for you, but everything is organised for you. You're told where to be, what time, what time you're being picked up. You're brought everywhere. You're fed, you're watered, you, your clothes are sorted. You, you you go from that to basically being catapulted out the other side yeah. and into kind of a big blank canvas. And you're like, who am I? What do I like? What do I want to eat? How do I want to dress? What do I want to do next? What do I want to do tomorrow? What do I want to do the next day? <laughs> like it's just, it's a really, really strange feeling. And it's almost like, you just got to pick up the pieces and put them all back together and decide what who you are again. And yeah, that's quite huge. It's quite huge. Did your phone stop ringing? Because mine did. Yeah. My phone stopped ringing. My fax machine stopped going. Yeah. Um, bizarre. Yeah, really, really bizarre. Yeah. But, it was a strange time. But character building, I would say. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. You know, you have to really delve deep in here and into your soul. Yeah, you do. And you know what? In some ways, I'm grateful for it because knowing the sort of person I am as well, I don't know if a lifetime full of that level of success and fame would have suited me. Mm. I think the it lasted for as long as it did at that level and I'm, I'm actually really grateful that some of our songs are still successful in their own right in terms of they still get played yeah. you know they're still uh, popular like people still remember us and our songs and stuff and we still gig and we you know we're releasing some new material and people are interested. Like I'm very, we we feel so grateful and blessed that we actually have that even now. Mm. Um, but I did watch a lot of other bands and artists at that time who were sustain trying to sustain that level over long periods of time, and they just crashed and burned. Yeah. And they, you know, went down, went off the rails, or went down the wrong path. And you just, you know, and it's like we didn't actually do that, and. I'm grateful in some ways that we got pulled out of, um, you know, that kind of intensity when we did. And now it's kind of, we dip in and out and it's on our terms, you know. Mm. Forgive me for name dropping, but uh, Tony Hadley from Spandau Ballet, mm -hmm. ex-Spandau Ballet. Um, yeah. Him and I were very, very good friends and we remain good friends to this day. And I remember yeah. going to his house um, in North London and we went because we used to play football together. Oh, okay. And it was about six or seven months after the band split up, and he mm. said to me, "What time are you getting out of bed in the morning? Out of interest?" And I said, "Oh, eleven. Sometimes I get out of bed at noon." He says, "Get out of bed at nine o'clock in the morning," and he said, "And find yourself a purpose." He said, "Find a purpose in life. That's what you have to do." Because yeah. I felt, you know, don't get me wrong. I I was very lucky. I'm I'm not an addictive character, so I was never into drinking. Mm -hmm. I was never into drugs. Yeah. So I never fell into that trap. Yeah. Um, but I needed something to do. And he said yeah. to me, focus on something and find yourself a purpose. 
I swear mm-hmm. to God, it was the best advice he ever gave me because absolutely, I, I, I jumped into football. Um, it didn't matter what capacity it was, but I used football as my tool mm. to, be able to reinvent myself to go again. And you said yeah. something which was really interesting, Lindsay. It's about, um, fi- uh, what was it you said? You said um, that it's really scary moving forward, but at, when you think back, it's the best thing that ever happened to you. And as weird as this sound, the band splitting up and me going through what was a really tough period was also the best thing that ever happened to me mm. because I came through it and I came through it a better person and a stronger person. And three years ago, when I lost my job in Qatar due to the pandemic, I used mm. my experiences from the band to be able to get through losing my job in Qatar. Mm. And it's, it, it, yeah. So that, what you said. About, Interesting. Yeah. You, and I find, and it's so interesting because I do find that this this is a recurring thing in most people's lives. There are there are chapters and there are periods of time, and you find that you you're in a position where you almost have to start again. Yeah. So many times, like you know, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a, a work, you know, a job or whatever. And interestingly, Bewitched, we did a podcast during lockdown because we. And that's called starting over. And it was based on that concept. It's like and we started it off with how we were, how we all felt after the band split up and how did we actually move on and pick up the pieces? How did we start over? And that's how that's what kicked it off. But um, then that inspired other subjects like how do you start over after a relationship? How do you start over after a financial crisis or whatever, you know? And it's so interesting because that is something that comes up in life all the time and it's such a good tool to have Mm -hmm. to be able to pick yourself up and put things in perspective and go okay I may have lost x y and z but I'm here I'm standing I have my health I can start over I can do the next thing what is the next thing Mm -hmm. let me figure that out and it's like you say that thing about getting up and having a structure to your day and having a discipline and not allowing yourself to get into that state of wallow and I think sometimes it's okay to do that, you know, yeah. you, you have to give that to yourself because <laughs> you have to go through that as well. And you have to sit with your feelings and you have mm-hmm. to go, do you know what? Today I feel because this happened to me and that got taken away from me and I feel angry or whatever it is, you know, but I think there comes a day where you have to go right. Today is the day mm-hmm. that I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to just look to the future and decide what's next for me. I think I think the difference, and I mean this with the greatest respect, is that from our experiences, we we almost yeah. had to do it in the the face of the the public eye. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. True. And I, you know, there were times where when I got myself a little job in a hotel gym, which mm. was again one of the best things that ever happened to me because it got me back earning money, gave me the purpose, blah yeah. blah blah, and people would recognise me, and there'd be digs. And there'd be jibes and people mm. would come in and give it, oh, hard. look at you now, what a fall from grace, all that sort of stuff. It's pretty which, hard. Which again is character building, trust me. Yeah. Um, and then Robbie Williams once said to me, because um, I went to watch him and do a few of his concerts before he got really, really big, because a friend of mine was his bodyguard at the time. Mm. And I was telling him this story and he said to me, I've got the perfect, the perfect phrase for you. He says, just say to them, oh, I'm sorry. You must have me confused with someone who gives a fuck what you think. <laughs> and I used to use it all the time. And <laughs> it, it, it worked. It worked. Yeah. It worked I perfectly. Um, I again, forgive me for name dropping there. Um, no, that, that's that, fine. that is hard. Can I ask you about the big reunion? Because that's what I'm really, really intrigued about. Did yeah. it feel second time around different or did you feel like you were stepping back in time? A bit of both. Um, definitely different. We were different women. We'd been through a decade or so of growing and developing in different ways. And, you know, for me personally, I felt like I'm much more of a confident person and much more kind of comfortable with who I am and um, voicing my opinion and speaking up a bit. And, um, and I think, you know, naturally you're just going to be slightly different 10 years later you know so in that in some ways that was that was my apprehension about the whole thing was like the dynamic worked back then but that doesn't mean it would work now like 
you know, we don't know how we're going to be together or if we are going to fit the same way. And I think initially it did feel a bit sticky, like it did. There was a bit of old residue from the past. A few issues needed to be ironed out and like nothing major. It was just personalities coming back together after 10 years and thinking, well, can we work together again? And I think after that initial period, it was like, then it felt like going back in time. Then it was like, oh yeah, this fits like a glove. This is this has never not been. Like we have not had 10 years apart. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It didn't, it was like stepping back. And even now it's just like, you know, the weird thing is that we've been together as a band longer, way longer now this time than we were initially. Bizarre. Um, which, is so, sometimes, yeah. which is sometimes the way. Yeah, I know. Um, were you were you ever and i really hope you understand where i'm coming from with this were you ever uncomfortable in your own skin about who you were and what you had been through um been through in the band do you mean yeah as in the experiences that you had the way that you split up etc um i mean like were you were, could you openly talk about your experiences with each other no, just just in, just in, in general. Like, like if you met a stranger, you know, if you if you I don't know if you're at oh, a wedding yeah. or something like that, and someone asks you and recognizes you, could you could you openly talk about your experiences? Yeah, okay. I've definitely, especially okay. now. Maybe not so much back then. I think I was a little bit more of a closed book back then. Okay. But now, yeah, definitely, I would be very very open. See, much more open. Because I'm exactly like you. Because back then, mm. no. I, I I I would change the subject very quickly, or, or I would even mm. go, no no I'm sorry you've got me confused with somebody else. Whereas now mm. I can very openly talk about it. Yeah yes yeah, and I think that comes with a bit of age as well. Like not not saying we're old, but like you know it just comes with experience. It's like it's just life. They're like of course I'm going to talk about it. It's just it is what it is, and I'm not afraid to say X Y and Z, or I'm not I don't care if you judge me. You know what I mean? It's that thing going back to. You must confuse me with someone who, you know, <laughs> but it is, it's like, I don't actually care what people think about me anymore. I, I am what I am. So it's like, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you, I'll tell you my story, you know. <laughs> Good for you. Right. I have two, two final questions for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you could have your time again before the first time that you guys split up, if you could change anything, now it could be, I don't know, it could be releasing a record it could be something that didn't quite go right in a meeting it could be an argument that you might have had if you could have your time again and change one thing from your time what would you change um one thing just one I think it would probably be what I mentioned earlier, which was at the end of that second album, we should have just taken a long break okay. to regroup and then reassess everything. Because I think rather than calling it a day, I think we should have just gone, just take time out for as long as we need. And rather than saying it's over, you know what I mean? Yeah. To kind of finalizing it. Okay. Hmm. How That's excited up. are you for the future? I'm very excited for the future um in general life is amazing right so we have to appreciate and be grateful and love life because life is the biggest gift that we have so i'm incredibly excited about the future i've got a beautiful family i've been very blessed and i have this other gift that keeps on giving which is the band and you know the, the three women who i share it with who are i'm gonna get emotional but who are such a, such pivotal people in my life and always have been. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, very grateful. Lindsay, it's, it's been absolutely <laughs> fantastic. It really has. Thank you so much oh, for coming on. Thank you. Thank it's you. been great chatting to you. <laughs> I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. If you have not already subscribed to The Accidental Popstar here on YouTube, I'd be very grateful if you would please consider clicking that little red button. It doesn't cost you anything as we continue to build here on YouTube. 
So that's us. We are all done. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode with Lindsay. And I'll see you again very soon for our brand new episode of The Accidental Popstar. See you soon.